Hello, Ada. Mark Hamilton here. I'm going to have a quick chat with Philip for you. So my question to you, Mark, is, is that you graduated with a BA in fine art from Portsmouth. What made you transcend from drawing to photography? Well, I was doing a lot of photorealist drawings uh, when I was doing my uh, bachelor's degree. And afterwards, I also worked as a kind of fine artist doing commissioned photorealist drawings. And they, they were also portraits. Um, so the work was based on photography. Um, it's important to note that I was not really a very good photographer. Um, I kind of did my three weeks or whatever they teach you at the university. And so I was just, I, it was very, very elementary photography I was doing. And uh, if I'd known uh, better photography, I probably would have made better drawings. Um, so that was already sort of in me. I was interested in it. And of course, the work I was making looked like photographs. They weren't brilliant because, um, I, <laughs> frankly, I was a little bit lazy in those days. And uh, doing photorealist work takes a lot of dedication and time. Um, I was very, very lucky, though, because people bought the work. <laughs> that kept me going for a while. Uh, a friend of mine came to me one day and said, hey, you can paint and draw. Can you hand color one of my photo shoots for a national newspaper in the United Kingdom? Uh, he was a fashion photographer. And I thought, well, why not? And you know, he was gonna pay me some good money for it. So I got the black and white prints and bought some dyes and read half a book. And um, somehow they liked them. And in the first year of doing that, so I, I got commissioned more and more. It's pure luck, I have to be really honest. Because um, within a year, uh, a lot of people knew about me. And at the time, uh, hand coloring was just very, very trendy. I got written up in a book about hand coloring, all sorts of things. So it's just pure luck. Um, that's a very, so it's getting a bit long winded, but what eventually happened then was I thought, hang on, I could probably take the photos myself and make significantly more money. So I'd be doing both things. Photorealism, actually. And how did you discover photorealism and what fascinated you about it? And was being an artist something you consciously strived for? I think I always wanted to be an artist. You know, ever since I was a kid, I quite like drawing and painting and stuff like that. And it was one of the few things at school where people would come up to me and go, man, you're really good at that. And, you know, at school, there's only ever one or two people in a class that can draw. So I think that's quite good. And I, I was just always interested in it. My father used to draw when he was young and stuff like that. Uh, Photorealism, I mean, I had tried a whole load of other things, abstract painting, all sorts of stuff. But I think I was a little bit seduced by the, the skill set, really, which I know is a little bit feeble. And I certainly, when I was studying, a lot of lecturers just thought it, was, it certainly wasn't very fashionable at the time. With, with photorealism, I really liked it because, I, I mean, I was seduced by the kind of the skills, but I kind of... I realized I liked the idea of by using drawing to sort of promote the status of photography because photography is always sort of regarded as a kind of, especially in the UK, I think in the States, they were kind of more into um, seeing it as fine art or something like that. But in the UK, it was still like, you know, oh, you're a snapper. And so I thought, well, if I make a big picture that looks like a photo, they'll be like, it'll get, sort of heightened status. I'm quite curious, sort of, you know, when you mention photorealism, you, you, there are such characters such as obviously Chuck Close that's been quite prominent in this sphere. Um, and what, you know, how did you look at Chuck Close in your own work? Well, I love Chuck Close and um, I was completely enamored of, of pretty well anything he did. He's also an extremely good photographer, but I loved his portrait work and it, it really, really influenced me. But I was conscious, probably latterly, that I was either not gonna try as hard as Chuck Close, or I simply did not have his skills or 
wonderful ideas. Uh, I think probably just uh, yeah, mixed up being a little bit lazy, which um, doesn't sound so good. But you know, when you're taking like a month to do a picture, when I probably could have done it in two weeks, it was getting a bit silly. And also, despite earning money, uh, by the time you factor in the hours, it just wasn't really viable. The other thing is that because I was starting to get commissioned and sort of successful, if you like, um, it kind of spoiled some of the excitement of being an artist, which is counterproductive, obviously. It's not a really clever way to think. But when people commission you, they start to have editorial, um, they often think they have an editorial position and they start saying, can you put this in the picture? Can you do that? And so for me, um, a lot of my reason for being a, a working artist was being diminished. You know, when you talk about your work, um, your work across photography and moving image, best seen in projects such as The Moon Revisited, Earthbound and Mission, centers itself around space and astronauts. Where does the source of such imagery come from? And why do you find these themes intriguing? Uh, well, uh, until you had asked me, I probably didn't spend a huge amount of time thinking about it. And um, the truth is, my father used to take me outside the house to look up into the sky and wait for hours to see um, if a satellite would um, pass or if, a, uh, if one of the American space program capsules would orbit. You know, you'd get he, he'd know when they were meant to orbit over Jamaica, which is uh, where I'm from. And we go and stand there dutifully and hope. I can't remember if we, fairly sure I did see once. And I, I was a bit un underwhelmed because it's just like seeing a star, except it's very tiny and it moves across the sky. But it really gripped me. And um, I've thought about this since because he did take me to air shows and stuff like that. So he must have had an interest um, that was quite strong because he, he, he would take us to the airport to watch planes taking off. He talked to me about the space pro program and all of that. Got me into it, I think. And I've always sort of had it in the background. And it's only recently I've realized that it does keep cropping up. And in fact, I have a very, very large photorealist drawing I did of the underside of a, an American military air aircraft. So I guess I've been doing it a long time. It's only recently that um, I kind of, I've had the privilege to have a little bit of time and so I could concentrate more on creating ideas and messaging uh, that I wanted to put across with the images. I think before it was more of an indulgence, you know, I kind of just made stuff to do with space and planes kind of because I liked them, pretty elementary. I love the power of the planes and the rockets and the noise and the aluminium and shiny metal. So it's a, a kind of all, it's a strong sensory response almost to anything that could get off the ground that was man-made. It's just very intriguing. Did you ever have a conversation with your father about his inspiration? What inspired him and what drew him so much to space and aircrafts? Do you know, I, I didn't. Um, it's one of those, he died when he was quite young. And I think often when we're young, we forget to quiz our elders or parents, you know? We kind of just go, oh yeah, okay. Well, you know, I'll go with you to the airport and watch planes. And um, I probably would want to know now, uh, obviously it's a little bit too late, but um, I have no idea why. He didn't speak about stuff like that, really. Just he was good. I guess he was more of an action man. Let's just go and see it. And um, yeah, that's a pretty good question. I just presume he liked them in retrospect. He never said why. It's quite interesting you mentioned that because obviously most recently there has been a lot of discussion about commercializing air travel uh, most famously through Virgin Galactic and SpaceX programs. Have you followed these developments at, at all and how have they impacted your work or have they? 
I do follow them. Uh, I follow them really quite closely. Um, to date, they haven't really had an impact on my work because I think my current and kind of long lasting fascination with space and aviation, the, it's, the reason it's sort of kicked off into a whole other area of my kind of art working is because I've got accessibility to all these materials that, that um, you could never have imagined we could have had. I can get audio, I can get moving image, I can get still images, transcripts, designs of spacecraft, and I can actually look at them. And I think in some ways it makes, it makes me feel that we can all be astronauts. Though, frankly, um, you would never catch me getting on uh, Virgin Galactic or uh, one of Elon Musk's uh, spacecraft. I just, I think I'm a little bit too, too much of a coward. So I think I like this stuff from afar. The moon revisited work which won the creative category of, the, of this year's Sony World Photography Professional Competition, contains previously unprocessed images of NASA's Apollo missions imbued with historic references from the pop art movement to COVID-19, which is quite current. Where did the idea of mixing historical imagery with current events come from? Um. I think that well, first it's probably it's probably kind of evolved at the same time as the whole uh, way of working with these images evolved because I, it, they all came out of experiments. And when I realized I could add three D um, materials into these uh, older images, I suddenly realized I could start changing the meanings. And initially, I did think quite specifically about um, relating them to the 1960s and the early 70s when the Apollo missions were actually uh, occurring. Uh, latterly, I just thought it's quite a nice idea to discuss a kind of uh, broader time, you know, from before Apollo and, and up until t today. And I think the art movement thing is a little bit me having a little bit of fun with a subject I like and I know about, but the rest of it are, you know, they're kind of current affairs or events that happened a while back. And I just thought it's quite a nice thing to do because nothing has ever changed on the moon. So in the whole time um, since the moon landings, you know, those, those um, spacecraft are still sitting on the surface. The footprints are still there. Nothing has moved. Nothing will be moved unless somebody goes there and physically moves them. And it, I, I like the contrast um, with the fact that on the Earth, everything has changed and changes all the time. It's completely dynamic. So I thought if you put something in there into this static environment, it's kind of a nice way of um, maybe provoking thought. You know, it makes us think a little bit more you know, about meaning and stuff. You know, the, the coronavirus one is just me having a bit of fun because I, I, I can't stand conspiracy uh, theorists. So I thought that's a really neat tie up. You know, you, it's probably, or I presume, a similar type of person that will have a conspiracy theory about COVID-19 as will about the moon landings. So that's a fairly uh, simple message. And with the art stuff, I'm probably not, I'm, I'm not trying to bewilder anyone because I'm conscious some people will not know that the Campbell's soup can has any connection with Andy Warhol, but it doesn't matter. I want them to still be able to enjoy the picture at face value. I do hope that people, when they look at any kind of image, you know, whether it's a painting or a drawing or a cinema or whatever, hope that we are conscious that we we should be trying to read an image because that's you know the you know visual grammar is something we can all understand and if you look at some of these things in the moon re revisited some of it's really obvious some not so so a very young person will not realize that the upturned m16s with helmets on the moon's surface they're not going to go oh that's the vietnam war but someone 
who say 40 to 70 may very well know that. The, the image still works because of course, the very young person can look at it and go, oh, he's referencing conflict in the world now. So I like the, the fact that it can be, you know, ambiguous enough for, for, for people to not to be baffled really, because I, you know, I don't see any point in creating any sense of bafflement with this. I, I liked when I discovered this way of working, I liked that I could get my message off and be quite explicit with my point, you know? I don't know if you're aware, but NASA actually today picked Elon Musk's SpaceX to build the spacecraft to return humans back to the moon. How do you think that would change or would it change your imagery once that would occur? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I saw that. I actually saw that on the, new, uh, on the news uh, quite recently. And I immediately started thinking, am I going to have to start making a 3D model of um, SpaceX's proposed lunar lander? Uh, so I'm obviously thinking about it. Where I'll go with it, I don't know. I think I am interested enough in contemporary space travel, you know? And SpaceX had these capsule, the Dragon capsule that went up to the space station, which is, I think it was SpaceX. Um, pretty remarkable because it looks like a very cool spaceship. And if you think of the older capsules, and in fact, even like the current Soyuz capsule that they go up to the uh, space station with, it's just like a big, horrible blob metal thing that looks very low tech. And finally, this uh, stuff from SpaceX is beginning to look like stuff that used to be in science fiction movies. So I'm quite intrigued by that. I guess I probably will be. And I can see some opportunities there for some commentary that would be relevant. Because of course, it's interesting now that these are private individuals who have the personal wealth to develop um, machines that can travel to the moon. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Most countries can't do that. Obviously, there's also this parallel to be drawn to films and sci-fi. Are you a film buffer? Would you consider yourself to be very involved in films? And how does how does sci-fi inspire you? I probably uh, I'd hesitate to say film buff only because I know so many people who know everything about film. Um, but I do love film and I've worked making moving image myself, which I do like. It's a very, very different discipline. Um, I mean, I'm, I have to say I have been strongly influenced by Stanley Kubrick's two, 2001, uh, even just as a visual piece. It's a very bewildering film and very beautiful. And considering it was made in 1969, I think, it's visually comparable to anything I've seen today. And you see a lot of people trying to emulate camera moves in it and, you know, all sorts of things, you know, one point perspective, a lot of what Kubrick does. So I'm, there's no question I'm not influenced by it. And I do like science fiction films, but not a huge, not a huge number of them, you know, not a giant fan of the genre, but I, I think I always liked the, the space travel type sci-fi stuff, definitely. Um, you've also mentioned um, Vietnam, obviously, in the past, and you're currently based in Hanoi after living yeah. in London since 1981, I think. How have your surroundings in Vietnam changed and influenced your photography? So the truthful answer is, uh, not very much, because most of the time here, I am, uh, you know, I'm working on these projects, Earthbound, who revisited, and, you know, not a lot of the material has been sourced here, although in Earthbound, I have used uh, photography that I've taken here domestically. Um, it's more to do with the fact, the reason I say that, it sounds very glib, because even if you've never traveled here, most people will have 
known or heard that Vietnam is a pretty spectacular country visually with a, you know, wonderful people and amazing scenery. And it's extremely varied uh, from the north to the south. It's uh, a photographer's dream. You know, a lot of people come out here, travel out here specifically to do photography. I thought about this for a while and I realized quite re recently that I don't really, I'm not good at coming in and just capturing the, the local beautiful people and the mashed up buildings and the landscape. First of all, other people do that a lot better than me. They really do. A lot of people, I'm, you know, I, I can stand in front of the Grand Canyon and make it look ordinary. I have not got that specific skill that a brilliant landscape photographer would have. I have taken beautiful landscapes here and they do look beautiful. I think they look beautiful because they are beautiful. Uh, I bring a small percentage to that. But photographing like the people who live here in situ uh, is not what I do. And again, I was forced to reflect on that when people were asking me why that might be the case. And this probably goes back to my childhood because I was always, you know, occasionally go to the north coast of Jamaica, which is where the tourists come, you know, the, the Brits and the Americans and the Canadians. And I'd see them just running around poking their cameras in people's faces and like photographing the side of a coconut tree and so on. I remember thinking, what are they doing? You know, it seemed sort of inappropriate, you know, like the, the, the sort of fascination with the native people and stuff. Well, I, I don't think there's anything innately wrong with that. And I think people are not always doing it with malintent. But for me, if I was doing that as a professional photographer here, I would want to bring something to it and add some value rather than just pictorial recording of, you know, an attractive people or dilapidated buildings, uh, stuff like that. So that is kind of why it hasn't had a huge effect on me. However, I go everywhere with my camera and I, I, all the things I say that I'm not photographing, I am photographing them, but they're not becoming part of my um, professional uh, work really, not in any big way. Um, you mentioned Earthbound just now, where you have an astronaut placed in very mundane settings um, on the pool um, in, I think, in all different parts of, was it, it was shot in Vietnam as well. And yeah. what was the focus of this work? Whilst coming to kind of a close, which I'm nearly at with, with uh, Moon Revisited, I still have one or two to, corrections to make and a few changes, but I started to work uh, using imagery I'd shot here and then putting an astronaut in. Now, a couple of things happened. First of all, I got um, Neil Armstrong's spacesuit that he wore on his lunar mission from, uh, well, I, when I say I got it, obviously I didn't get it. I got the uh, uh, high-res 3D model from the Smithsonian Institution. And I thought, well, hey, I can bring the astronaut back to Earth. And I did naturally try using some of my uh, images taken locally, and I did take some pictures for it. So there's a picture of him in the water, which is in Ningbing, so it's a landscape. Um, I was kind of thinking of the fact that the Apollo capsule was used to land in the water, so I put him there. That is also something to be resolved, um, that picture. But another one, he's in a, I just like the irony, he's in a Circle K, which is an American store in Hanoi, which the Americans uh, were bombing quite heavily for a while. Uh, and he's walking around with an M16 rifle in that store. So in a way, what I'm just doing is taking the astronaut, bringing them back to Earth. In the images, I am also using elements that I have had on the moon. So the M16 is back in the picture. I kind of like 
this the interplay that the, so the astronauts back on Earth, but the pictures don't have other humans. So I sort of thought of the astronaut, if you like, as representing mankind, which is a bit of a, a kind of a play on the idea too that um, Neil Armstrong uh, Armstrong talked about the one small step for a man, giant leap for mankind. So I like the idea that he's back on the earth and it has all changed and it's completely different. Uh, and there are no other people, so no other recognizable people that might detract from the message. So it's sort of, you know, it's a weird project because it's sort of evolved from just this one, just from getting the spacesuit, if you like. And I have now these pictures there with Miami, Dansk in Poland. Um, can't remember where else, but so he's got, he's an astronaut who's going to be around the world. You know, he's a, a bit of a mover and shaker. And the images that I'm working on all have just that little um, thing in the background, like the trash can or something that would reflect the fact that perhaps these things on the moon, it makes the audience wonder what came first, earthbound? Or was it the moon revisited? You know, so there's a kind of strange um, play between the two projects, which I think is going to work. I hope it's going to work. Um, what message would you like to relay to future generations through your work? That is very, very difficult. And I thought about it. And I mean, for me personally, I would just love to think that I personally could make a contribution with some sort of message that doesn't have to be um, hugely poignant or anything, but you know, just to have the ability or the opportunity to say something and have it heard in the future, I, I find quite interesting and sort of relates to space travel um, somehow and science fiction. But if I was thinking of the general public, I would kind of like to think that, um, because I realized in this thing, you know, that I talk about the static nature of the moon and the dynamic nature of the earth. Um, you know, it's a great privilege to live in this dynamic uh, environment, but I would really like to see the things change with that dynamism where we can use it to improve. And perhaps it wouldn't necessarily, then it wouldn't necessitate people like me having to put guns and make comments about war and viruses and stuff like that in, in imagery. It's a kind of utopian idea because I think I realized that in many ways, the earth is actually very static too. Although we think we advance and all of that, we're still very elementary. We're still gonna be war fighting in a thousand years time and so on. So that's a little bit depressing. Um, I, I don't think, I think for creative people and artists and young artists, you know, whether they're musicians, filmmakers, designers, um, I would like to think that people could realize, you know, if, if they heard what I said or, or, you know, I've been fortunate. I've, you know, I've got a Sony award. I've had a few awards and things before, but this is quite a big one. So I'd encourage artists to understand that it's really, about having conviction and a message. You can't just make pictures, you can't just design things. Everything you're doing is for your audience. And if you think that just making a beautiful drawing of someone is adequate, the problem is you're gonna find out it's not. Because everybody can draw something and everybody can paint something and everybody can make a video with their phone, but you've got to make say something, you, you know? And we all have something to express. So I think the thing, my message would be, if you've got something to say, shout out from the rooftops. You don't have to go on Facebook and get bitter and twisted. All you have to do is say something poignant and you don't need to say it loudly, you just have to say it clearly. That's what I think you need to do. To mention um, the 
obviously fantastic feat of winning the creative category for the Sony World Photography Competition. What made you submit your work to it in the first place? Um, when I've been when I started working on this quite quickly, I was thinking to myself, you know what? There's something going on with this project. I feel like it's probably the most coherent piece of work I've made. The narrative is strong. The messaging is crystal clear. Um, the images are easily digestible. And, and I did, I, and I thought, you know what? I actually, for the first time, I thought they're actually quite original. I know that doesn't sound very self-effacing, but you do have to sometimes have um, confidence in what you're doing. I mean, most artists like myself, you know, 95% of what you've made is actually not much, but it's all process. All of it adds up, you know, it goes like that. It adds up into something uh, that makes you more coherent as an art worker. So I actually looked at this thing and I thought, I've entered competitions before. I looked at it and I thought, I have a chance here. I was conscious, of course, there will be um, regular photographers who, who will be going, that, that's not really photography. You're using a virtual camera, you're using virtual objects and materials. That's not photography. And I, I don't want to get into a fight with anybody about it, but I kind of think, well, if it looks like a photograph, it is a photograph. And you could say my virtual camera, well, that's only virtual. But, you know, we could go back 20 years and we could say that, you know, a digital camera isn't a real camera. It hasn't got any film in it. So I was very pleased to be selected for that. I thought I had something novel and uh, it, it turns out I did. I've had a very good response. Um, to the whole thing. I'm sure I'm not going to hear from people who may think it lacks the traditional skills of photography or, or skills or mechanics of photography. Um, I do normal, I do normal photography also. That's the main thing I do actually, you know. But this is uh, this is my real creative work and artistic work. So it's very nice for somebody to give me a big pat on the back and go, hey. Uh, we agree with you. <laughs> Mark, congratulations once again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the weekend. Philip, no problem at all. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And um, you have a wonderful weekend too, man.